Billy Walker for those of you that, that we haven't met and those of you that uh, can't remember. And I'm the uh, one of the instructors on the Stearman. And as I mentioned earlier, I also fly the SNJ. I think the Stearman is the one that won my heart and uh, it's offered the most challenges as far as uh, flying the airplane. And that's because, as we talked earlier in uh, Francois' class, this is a challenging airplane and it does what it's designed to do. It was designed to wash out pilots. And our job now is to try to prevent it from washing us out. So far, it's ahead of the game a little bit, but uh, we're working on it. And hence, the idea behind us having the uh, extra training class. This is the first year we've had actually a tailwheel ground school. And frankly, I'm surprised because I think we should have had one probably here from the get-go. And nice job this morning, too, uh, Francois and, and uh, Sky. Is Sky here? He's not here. Some of the guys went to the uh, Stearman tailwheel program that, that we had uh, in December. I missed it because my wife said that if I was ever going to see her naked again, I would take her to the river walk in, uh, in San Antonio, so that's where we were. <laughs> so anyway, today we're going to cover some of the nuances of the, of the Stearman in, in particular. Uh, it has some nuances that um, certainly are different from some of the other airplanes and again it's just the way it's designed. It's got the, the narrow tall gear, it's got the fuel tank up in the upper wing and it throws everything forward. So Francois and I have a little debate going on as far as where the tail should be when you the, the tail should be in the back, but where the tail should be relative to the runway is you're taking off. We'll cover that, and uh, if if Pete and and Chris or Francois, any of you that have been flying the airplane, want to throw anything out, uh, interruptions are acceptable. Questions are okay. Better left for the end of it, but feel free to to uh, interject anything. And nice job. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Looks great. It's won three first place awards, so we're proud of how it turned out. And it's really, my wife said, why didn't you invent this sooner where you buy an airplane, fix it up, and sell it to somebody else and still get to fly it? So I'm like the old whore. I sold it, but I still got it. <laughs> The uh, revision number seven is now revision number eight. So if anybody would like the new revision eight, I will email that to you. So what we'll try to do is start a list. You can put your your names down on it and a uh, email address, and I'll make sure you get the current revision number eight. Here's the specifications. It's a 1943 uh, B75N1. Most of you are aware that there's all kinds of different designations to the Model 75. Basically, they're all the same airplane from the firewall back. A few differences. The Navy airplane has a, uh, right here, at this point where you see that little blue light, there's a flat spot for that blue light. That's a night formation light. Other than that, it's the same as the Army airplanes. But anymore, you can't tell what's what because they've all been damaged and repaired. Well, most of them have been crop dusters. It's uh, designed to have a student, an instructor, 400 pound weight. Some of us have exceeded that a little bit. <laughs> Serial number is uh, 7540 and the bureau number doesn't matter to us. The wingspan 32 feet 2 inches doesn't matter in our big hangar here it only matters that that you not park it closer than uh, an inch or so to the other airplanes because as you you look on the the lower wing tip of the right wing you'll see where somebody got a little too close to something 
Uh, gross weight, uh, it used to be 2,700 pounds in the military. It's for civilian certification, it's been up to 2,950. The uh, Sturmans with the bigger engines, like the 450s, so forth, they have a higher gross weight of about 1,000 pounds more. No more than 60 pounds in the bag each, and it's a W670-6N, 220 horsepower, which is the same as the, the military version, uh, R670-4. That just has to do with the uh, uh, particular uh, <coughs> series of engines built for the airplane. They came out with different uh, model engines for the Stearman. The Lycoming 9-cylinder, 225 horsepower, which is actually the same engine, is an Ed Stearman out here in the hangar, which is 300 horsepower. Just turns faster and has a constant speed prop. We have both the Macaulay prop here, but we use primarily the uh, MT wood prop. The MT wood prop is uh, 96 inches long and it's 59 pounds lighter than the Macaulay and it runs smoother but it doesn't have quite as good performance as a Macaulay prop. <clears throat> the history on this airplane, built in 1943 for the Army, but a group of these airplanes were all bought by the Navy. Apparently the need were such that the Navy ended up with them. This airplane went from the factory and all Model 75s were built designed by Boeing engineers, not Lloyd Stearman, and built at Boeing Wichita. All of the Stearmans were. They built approximately 8,500 airplanes, enough parts for 10,000 airplanes, and um, this one in 1943 went from Wichita to uh, Naval Air Station Dallas, then it went to <coughs> Naval Air Station Hutchison. Who'd ever thought of a Navy station in the middle of Kansas, but then it went from there to, to, uh, uh, to the Chicago area uh, or Glenview Naval Air Station and spent most of its career there and uh, retired from the Navy at the end of World War II, went into the war assets, was sold in a big group of airplanes. Those airplanes went to uh, <coughs> probably some crop duster, some independent owner and sat till 1958. Then it was started started its crop duster career and then later was bought by a civilian, went to two or three civilians before I ended up buying it from a fellow in uh, Carbondale, Illinois. Brought it back here, flew it a few years and then restored it to what you just saw up there and what you see up in the hangar. It's got a 350 mile range, but most of us pilots, especially us older guys, have about a two hour range. And that's usually when we're flying cross country, we'll figure the airplane on that. No, basis. yours is not even an hour. What's that? Yours is not even an hour. I can do better than an hour. Right. If you got an empty water bottle. <laughs> this is gonna, it's going to get tough in here in a minute. The ceiling is 13,300 feet. I've never been up that high in a steerman. Takeoff distance, pretty accurate at 600 feet, even here at uh, 1,390 feet above sea level. Lands 400 to 500 feet. Power off stall, book, book wise, is 55. Uh, power off and power on at 50. Actually, the airspeed will be closer to 40 with the weights that we're flying. We, we usually uh, carry about half fuel, 46 gallon max fuel we carry, usually about half. It's best for training because, again, I mentioned we have that high weight, high sport CG, and we reduce that a little bit by carrying half of half fuel. Maximum speed 186 miles an hour. I can't imagine anybody being able to get a steerman straight down, power on that fast. But apparently, they did that in the initial uh, certification for the military. And the uh, test pilot went up to 15,000 feet, dove it straight down, power on got to his terminal velocity, which apparently was 186. 
pulled straight back on the thing, blacked out, recovered about 10,000 feet, landed. There wasn't a ripple on the airplane. So it's as strong as strong gets in, a, in an airplane. Original, uh, originally it was about 12 positive and about six negative. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't ever intend to get anywhere close to that, but uh, it's nice to know the airplane's really well built. <clears throat> Fuel consumption, we always use about 12 to 13 an hour if we're doing acrobatics, figure, figure about 15 gallons an hour. Oil consumption for the Continental engine is about a quart an hour. This airplane will burn a quart to two quarts in 10 hours. So it's it's, uh, it's been a good engine that way. <clears throat> we use 100 low lead. It was originally de designed with 73 octane. You can't even get 80, 87 anymore. So everybody that's using av gas is now 100 low lead until they make the next change to get the total lead removed from the fuel. And I don't know when that'll be. So we're 100 low lead, 46 gallons, 40 of it's usable and uh, for flight planning, 13 gallons an hour. Well, we use uh, now Aeroshell 120, it's a 4.4 gallon capacity in the tank. Don't ever put it over four, you would just be wasting oil. <coughs> we run it for right around three and a half to four, four gallons. We have a little bottle that some of you have noticed. We have a Curtis valve in between the bottom two cylinders and it's spring loaded. <coughs> We have a little bottle, we push up, turn to lock the, the Curtis valve open, we drain the oil into that bottle, put it back into the tank, and that has saved us a whole lot of wiping. Before we had that system, every time we got done flying, those of you guys that have been flying the airplane well know how much wiping we used to do. Now, you might have a, a, a drip, maybe even none, but uh, it's much better now. Part of that was uh, the pressure that was behind the... Uh... Oh, you hey, Rich, come on up and share that with us. This is a cheap one. Those of you uh, that haven't seen the little adapter we have is an oil line running off the accessory case where the JASCO alternator is. We we're getting a lot of oil pressure through the uh, accessory case, through the alternator, and that's where the oil was coming from. And it was just everywhere in the, in the engine compartment. We'd have to wipe it down after every flight. Now with that, that line coming off the accessory case, it relieves that pressure, takes it down into the bottom where the Curtis valve is, and we drain that out and then we put it back. It's all reusable. You'll notice a little pop bottle down on the lower left <coughs> strut. That's just kind of a courtesy bottle that I st stuck on there when I first started getting uh, oil dripping on people's ramps, so I've just kept it there. We had one complaint by one of the guys from Midland, but uh, when Pete and, uh, and, and John took it down to Midland, where it won best of show, by the way, <clears throat> the guy never said a thing about it, and they forgot to take it off. So we've left it on because it keeps the thing from <clears throat> piddling out little drops of oil on, on the ramp. So that's what that bottle's for. And it's removed every so often, dumped out, and put back on. So it's, uh, it's, it's not an approved item, but it works, so we use it. German training, you have to have a FAA commercial, a second class medical, 500 hours as PIC, 50 hours logged in tailwheel aircraft, annual ground training and flight training. Transition letter, as Russ mentioned earlier, is required prior to uh, 10 hours of dual or till you've achieved proficiency. We have uh, the 10 hours plus 50 landings minimum are required. We also require 90 day progress checks, 30 day currency with three takeoffs, landings to a full stop. And if you must be done with a, uh, with a qualified IP. 
if your currency lapses in excess of 90 days, he or she is required to complete the entire 602 proficiency plan. So it's, it pays you to maintain your currency, but if you don't, we have a system in place that uh, we can handle that. Any passenger, without exception, is required to sign uh, the CAF hold harmless. That CAF hold harmless now cannot be signed by the pilot. It has to be signed by somebody that's not going to be on the flight, and that's in any airplane. Everybody understands that? That's a new, kind of a new thing that's, uh, that's, that's uh, now in place. Ops officer, that's the guy standing up interrupting the class right there. They always do. He, uh, he must approve any personal flight. So used to be guys that just come out and they go fly and didn't check in with anybody. But Midland raised hell with Russ, so Russ is raising hell with us that he needs to approve that. So be sure you get the okay. You got to get the okay from Alan. Alan Arnold, the ride coordinator, owns the airplane. That's his airplane. And it's primarily there to, to sell rides. So if you want to fly it personally, Check with Alan if he is okay with it. Then get a hold of Russ somewhere or another, email or phone or whatever. Make sure he's okay. With it. <clears throat> if you're going to be a, a PIC on revenue flights, you're required to have logged a minimum of 25 hours. It's now 100 hours. Then 50 landings prior to perform. No, oh, wait a minute. It's 25 hours. That's right and 50 landings prior to performing revenue flights. It's 100 hours now if you're gonna wheel landings without an instructor. Now, Francois and I have been discussing that, but that's a decision through uh, Russ and, and Stenovic down at Midland, so if that changes to where people can do wheel landings, outside that requirement, that's a decision that, uh, that's going to have to come out through, through <clears throat> Russ. But now's a good time if people have a problem with that to let Russ know what their thoughts are on that and uh, go from there. But at this point, if you're going to do wheel landings in the steerman, you got to have 100 hours in the airplane. And I think Pete, who's even a, not only an IP but a check pilot in it, I don't know that you have 100 hours in it, do you? So say something, Russ. Now that that is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'll move on. <laughs> you don't have to have Russ's approval for revenue rights, but all rights, regardless, have to be approved by the right coordinator. 964 uses the German MT fixed pitch wood prop. I told you it was 96 inches diameter and is shorter than the Macaulay, which is 102. Even though the Macaulay's heavier, you get because of the length of the prop, you do get a little bit better performance. I'll just let you read this particular statement. This is a general statement, but it's a true statement. And because of the way the airplane is, it's got a large upper wing, and it downwashes on the vertical stabilizer and rud rudder, and, and Francois discussed that earlier. That means that during the transitional stage of raising and lowering the tail, you lose <coughs> rudder effectiveness. Also at slow speeds, the tendency is to try to correct with the aileron, and for the reasons that Francois discussed this morning, totally ineffective and will exacerbate the problem because of uh, aileron reversal, what little there is. Better in the steerman if things get cockeyed to neutralize your ailerons. Do all your correcting with rudder and at the last resort, brakes. Very effective brakes on this airplane. They're red line brakes. You saw from the video this morning how quick the airplane will flip over if somebody lands with the brakes locked on it. 
and they are very effective uh, red line, whereas Ed's Stearman, you can barely hold the airplane still at, uh, at 1,000 RPM using full brakes, because he's got the old type brake system on. <clears throat> Francois discussed visibility. It's terrible in the steering. And it's true that you have to use your peripheral to keep the airplane lined up with the center of the runway. Limited power, so if you're flying the airplane on a hot day, another good reason to have partial fuel because of, because of the weight. If you have two big guys in the airplane, it really does struggle. So some days are, are too hot really to, to effectively fly the airplane or safely fly it. It's a high drag airplane. You can come into this airplane at 100 or 105 indicated right as you're approaching the end of the runway, pull the power off, slow down, and land within the touchdown zone. There's so much drag in the airplane. Prior to flight, you got to have your certificates, your medical. And stop me if I go too fast with anything. Logbook uh, check filled out on the pre-flight. John covered that, what, what's required. Physical inspection, including uh, aircraft registration, airworthiness, CAF form. All those forms are in a little packet right to your uh, right elbow in the aft cockpit. Mags off, pulled through 10 blades. Why 10 blades? We've got a seven cylinder engine. We've discovered just accidentally that if the engine stops and you don't pull through 10 blades, that's 10 half rotations, that you can open up one of the exhaust or two of the exhaust valves, dump oil into the exhaust stacks. You know, there's little uh, weep holes at the bottom of the lower exhaust stacks. If oil's leaking out that, then you will get to do a whole lot of wiping when you get done, because it's just going to blow oil all over the airplane. And we found just by doing, instead of five or six <coughs> pull of the uh, prop through before uh, on, your, on your walk around, that that's eliminated that problem with the <coughs> oil coming out of the weep holes. Physical inspection includes your aircraft registration, airworthiness, CF form, mags off, pull through blades. Pull your bottle and ensure the Curtis valve is closed. We had a guy that's new to the airplane, forgot that the Curtis valve had to be snapped down, took the bottle off, the Curtis valve still left open, flew the whole thing, there was enough scavenging in the, in the system that he didn't lose any oil until the engine stopped. Then he had a big pool of oil under the airplane. So when you take that bottle off, make sure that that spring-loaded, it's got two little ears on that, make sure that's spring-loaded and snapped all the way to the bottom. Everybody understand what I'm talking about? If you don't, we'll go out and look at it because the, uh, the bottle should be hooked up to it. It's easy to see what I'm talking about. If you're flying solo, be sure you have those belts secure. It's very easy for those belts, to, even if they're secure, to be loose enough that the straps could interfere with your rudder from the back cockpit. So make doubly sure that those belts are fastened together, tight enough that you don't have any drooping uh, belts down at the side where your rudders are. It's got a prime system. We like uh, eight shots of prime. You can't over prime this engine. You just can't. Prime it uh, 10 shots, 12 shots. He'll have fuel running out, but it won't bother the start. We get like eight, when the airplane's cold, use eight prime shots. When it's hot, three or four. I usually use four. It works pretty good. Starts right up every time. Just crack the throttle, mixture rich, get the thing clear, you turn it over switch as it's going through a couple of, of uh, blade movements, then switch it to both, fires right up. 
kickback's common with this wood prop because it's so light. So if you haven't seen it kick back, that's common. If you have to hand prop it, it's really critical on this, just do it on one magneto, preferably the right magneto. We have these magnetos set. The, uh, the, the book calls for 32 uh, on the uh, right magneto and 29 on the left magneto because they were using an inertial starter in, in wood props primarily back in World War II. They had a lot of problems with kickback. So that's why it used to be where you'd always start on one, one uh, magneto. We can start on both with no problem now because they're, they're set the same. Uh, warm up 20 degrees minimum and don't take off until you have at least 25. Now, that's a lot less than some of the edges that we're used to. The, the uh, SNJ, for example, you don't want to take off until you have at least 60 degrees, but it does warm up quicker. One, one trick on the Stearman for warm ups if the air is free of debris, you can use the, uh, the uh, carburetor air heat and you can also lean out the mixture. That helps get the oil warmed up just a little bit faster. Make sure though, that if you do that, you go back to uh, in, uh, max enrichment on the mixture and, and uh, close the uh, carburetor air. I'm a staunch advocate, Francois, of the tail low versus tail high and takeoffs. And not every, everybody agrees with me, but I'll give you the, re the reasons why I feel strongly about it. And I'm hoping that, uh, yeah, I guess we can see that, okay. <clears throat> if, you, if you look at the diagrams here, it's the airplane sitting on the ground, if you take, the, actually, the, the CG is figured from the datum line, which is the lower leading edge of the bottom wing. But if you look and just dropped a uh, plumb bob straight down from the leading edge of the upper wing, it will hit right at the back of the tire with the airplane just sitting there in the three-point position. On takeoff, using the tail low technique of takeoff, Raising the tail like you have up above, this transitional point, the upper wing blanks out a lot of the rudder. So you have some factor involved in that. But the big thing is, now you have the weight right over the center of the tire. If you go way up with the tail, it's easier to see over the nose that way. But now you've moved all that weight forward and it's actually forward of the uh, of the wheels. So if you do have a swerve, the tendency is for that thing just to roll like this and exacerbate the already existing ground loop tendency. Everybody see that? Francois, you're welcome to debate that, you know. I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to debate it with you, Billy. I think everybody has their own personal preferences. In my experience, even in the steering, I prefer the what you call the tail high, but everybody has their own preference. If you're flying with me, this is what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Don't force the tail up on takeoff. A light touch of the, of the stick. You'll feel when the airplane wants to lift its tail help it with just slight amount of pressure. And as soon as the tail starts coming up, then you start coming back, don't pull a stick back, just pressure. You hold pressure to hold the tail in the proper position. It flies off perfectly every time. It works good. And then you lower the nose. You're still basically in the ground effect. So you want to lower the nose, pick up your speed, and then climb out. Good climb speed on this, good approach speed on this is 80. You can fly it much slower than that. 80 is good for over the nose approaches. 80 gives you a pretty good climb rate and still good over the nose visibility. So that is technique. You can, you can fly it down to 70 if you want, if you want to. But 
again, that's technique. I do recommend the 80 for the for those reasons. Tail low or tail high, keep it straight. Keep the tail behind you. Happy feet. Where's Bob Jacobson? Here. Yeah. Bob Jacobson. That's still. I wake up at night screaming. Happy feet, happy feet, happy feet. <laughs> Never stop dancing. There you go. If you stop dancing, and that's what's it, so true with this. So true with the steering. You, you, you just have to be very light. If you do get a swerve and you try to correct, if you overcorrect, you're going to just be going the other way. Francois covered that, and it's so true with this with the steering. It uh, it will have more of a tendency to swerve to the left. But when you correct, if you overcorrect, you're going to be going back the other way. And then you're going to be doing a whole bunch of these things. Full control inputs only if necessary. Don't count on the power, but you may need a little burst of power to help straighten out the airplane. Your view from the rear cockpit, as Francois covered earlier, is very limited. And your liftoff transition to level accelerate to climb speed is a, is a very gradual thing because you're going to have your peripheral vision working for you on takeoff to keep you on the center line. As the tail comes up and then the airplane lifts off, you still have limited visibility, but it's mostly peripheral until you get the nose up and start accelerating. The airplane has, as with a lot of uh, the military airplanes, have a power enrichment valve. Well, a lot of airplanes have a power <coughs> reduction uh, enrichment valve. So if you move the throttle back a quarter of an inch or so, you don't see any change in your RPM, but you get out of the enrichment valve. From a safety standpoint and a cooling standpoint, it's probably better to leave the, the throttle full till you're at least 500 feet. Then you can come out and save gas. You're paying for the gas to pull the uh, throttle back about a quarter of an inch. You, again, won't see any uh, change on your tachometer, but you will get out of the enrichment valve. That's a couple of gallons an hour, probably. 75 to 82 miles an hour uh, full power uh, S turns to uh, you know clear your area. We've got a lot of student traffic here. If your head's not on a swivel, then you're really asking for it because it, <clears throat> half the time the tower will tell these people what they want them to do and they do just the opposite. So just be on your toes, especially at these airports around like Deer Valley, Falcon, Chandler, where you have so much foreign student traffic where there's a language issue. Regardless of that, it's just smart to keep your head on a, on a swivel. Power settings, to lean or not to lean. 80, 85 knots, uh, true airspeed. We fly this, this flies at the speed of smell. So you're going to be cruising somewhere between 85 and 95 miles an hour. You're going to climb it 75 to 80 miles an hour. You're going to use your approach speeches anywhere from 70 to 80, wherever you're comfortable with. I use 80, but that's a technique, and I've given you the reason why I do that. Pete, you got four flight for crosswinds and fuel prices. You wanna, you wanna discuss that? Sure. Everybody know what four, four flight is? You don't need that for local flying, but and we basically do everything here in gas the airplane here where the prices are considerably less. But Four Flight does have a program for whenever you do cross country, and uh, if you want to know more about it, we can cover that independently. What do you mean by bring a cushion? I don't know which S and M shop you got those. <laughs> Some kind of weirdo torture device to get those cushions from, but man, I was about ready to chuck that thing out the airplane about two hours on the way to Midland. They're hard cushions. 
Yeah. And if you're tall, actually for real, if you are tall in the airplane, the, the cushions sit up real high, especially in the back seat. So if you want to find a slightly shorter cushion, you're going you're to get your head out of the wind a lot more for a long cross-country flight. So, There's I mine. My, I have my own. I just didn't bring it. He's right. The seats are not comfortable for long, long flights. Pete and, and uh, John flew the airplane, as I mentioned earlier, down to Midland, and that's a long, a long flight. You can make it in one day. It took you at least two. Well, we had, had a little brake issue. Yeah. We needed to get fixed. <clears throat> it's this is probably the most important thing we're going to talk about today. In the Stearman, more than any other airplane I've flown except maybe a Newport, um, do not accept quarterly tailwinds. They are just a road to disaster. Tailwinds are bad enough. Do not accept more than a five knot tailwind. If you have a lot of time in the airplane, maybe an eight knot tailwind. But I just don't recommend it. This, this airplane reacts. I flew the SNJ down to Tucson. They gave me about a 10 knot tailwind. I will never do that again. That was, I was really busy. And uh, you don't like to get that busy in these airplanes. Now, the Stearman is a lot worse than the SNJ. So, so uh, just don't accept a quarterly tailwind at all. And don't accept anything more than a five, five knot tailwind. And if you need to, as was suggested this morning, just tell the tower you're not accepting that, and uh, and you know we're, you're going to wait for them to change the runway so where you can land more into the wind. Crosswinds are not a big deal. I mean, they're it's better to land into the wind, but uh, crosswinds are nothing compared to a quarterly tailwind or a tailwind. Pattern speeds, 85, 80 to 70, 75 is about right. Uh, again, I use on, on takeoffs and approaches 80. Uh, power, you can, uh, you can come and you can start your descent in a pattern with uh, about 1,500 RPM, come back to about 1,000 RPM and, and reduce it to uh, zero over the end of the runway and it works out pretty good. Pattern spacing from the runway, uh, you want to be closer than you normally are in other airplanes. And I always teach, as you recall, when we're down at, at uh, Gateway, just keep the edge of the runway right on your, your lower wingtip of whichever direction you're going. Seems to work out pretty good. That way, if the engine quits, you can always get in. But also, it just works out better for this particular airplane because it has a glide ratio equal to a polished toolbox. So, so if you're looking down here, that's where you're going to be landing if the engine quits. You're not going to glide like you are in Russ's 170. It's, you're going to be down here, very close. And Billy, my technique for that is underneath the end strut. Yeah. What's that? Underneath the end strut. Yeah. So inside the wing tip, <coughs> under the end strut. Even better. Flaps. What kind of flaps do we have in here? We have side slips. Three point uh, versus wheel landing. Oh boy, that's uh, that's Pete. That's Why don't you discuss that, Pete? Um, here's my viewpoint as an instructor in the airplane. You're coming to us with 25 hours of tailwheel time, for 50 hours of tailwheel time, and a tailwheel endorsement. I expect you to be able to do both of them to at least a reasonably competent standard. I will instruct both of them in the airplane. You will leave my 10 hours with you or with Billy being able to do both of them in the airplane. Obviously, some people are going to be more comfortable with one than the other. Uh, and we do tend to stress three-point landings in this airplane. I'm more comfortable flying three-pointers in this one. You're more comfortable flying three-pointers in this airplane. Um, but you will be able to do both. So brush up on techniques and talk to different instructors in different airplanes about about uh, you know what goes into each. But we're gonna we're gonna get plenty of landing practice, and there's gonna be quite a few of either of them. 
be able to do. Okay, <clears throat> to reiterate though, if you're solo, you have to do uh, three points until you have 100 hours in the airplane, then you can, unless you're with an instructor, then you can go out and practice wheel landings. Until that changes, that's the rule, right, Russ? Points that were made this morning, don't favor one side or the other in the, in the flare. Keep the airplane going down the center of the runway. Do what you have to do to correct the drift prior to touchdown. If you land the airplane with a side load, you're just asking for a ground loop situation to develop. In this airplane, if the ground loop situation does develop, it's usually going to happen fast. And if you haven't already started to uh, caught on to that early on and started your correction, you will experience a ground loop. Fix any drift. Controls, then power, then brakes. Brakes is your last resort in this airplane. The only time I use brakes is to hold point at uh, waiting for takeoff, doing my run up, and parking the airplane. You shouldn't need any brakes. There's so much drag on this airplane that you can land and turn off very early. So. Uh, Starting training or continuing training as a steerman, brakes is always your last resort, no matter what the situation is. But to correct a ground loop situation, don't start with the brakes. Try to, at the, at the very last, resolve it with your brakes. <coughs> Okay, let's discuss sink rates, crosswinds, bounce recoveries, throttle. That's a problem in the Continental engine. We have what's called a Continental cough that's, that startles everybody. Uh, if you push the throttle up too fast, you'll get it to cough. And that's disconcerting because even when you know it's going to happen or can happen, when it does happen, it gets your attention very quickly. To especially depending on where you are. Transition to a three-point and brake use. Sink rate. So if you develop a high sink rate, you're going to bounce. In this airplane, correcting from a bounce is usually best by going around. Most people that try to correct a bounce, if they get too high, unless they're used to it and can bring in a little power to correct it and make a landing, they end up bouncing again and then they get into the crow hop situation and then it ends up in a, in a mess. So yeah. it, at least at first, if you don't have an instructor on board with you <clears throat> and you develop a bounce, just go around. Live to fight another day. Crosswinds. The airplane does fine uh, either wheel landing or stall landing in, in a crosswind. You do the same thing that you do in any other airplane. You correct for drift, which means that you can land on, on the upwind wheel and the tailwheel in a stall landing, and then the downwind wheel lands, lands next. You can do that in, in very high wind situations, even stall landing, where a lot of people are more comfortable landing the upwind wheel in a wheel landing in a crosswind and then lowering the the the, uh, the downwind wheel and then the tailwind but in a in a high crosswind especially low time in the airplane you're better for doing a, a stall landing on the uh, on the upwind or the uh, upwind wheel and the tailwheel and then the downwind wheel and it's okay in a steerman actually to land the tailwheel first that's you don't get points against you for doing that. Where you get points against you if you land on the wrong wheel with a drift, that's that's the bad part. So those things you need to men mentally go through in your mind, especially if you're going out and you have a little crosswind. Think about how the airplane's going to react because it's for sure going to react that way. And it's up to you to maintain the kind of control you need to prevent those things from developing. Bounce recovery, same thing. If you if you have a high sink rate, you bounce, go around, live to find fly another grade. The throttle, 
nice smooth throttle inputs on this airplane because you will get that continental cough they call it. Brake use, don't use them unless it's a last resort. Uh, did I mention that? <laughs> okay, post flight. Install that bottle as soon as you can because that'll drain all that oil out of the bottom rocker covers and the uh, and the accessory case. And that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, reduces the oil wipe downs. Please wipe down the the uh, inside and outside of the cowling. <coughs> And, and just plain water on a rag will wipe the bugs right off. If you get the bugs while they're fresh, it's real easy. If you don't and you leave the airplane with bugs on it, you're just going to piss off the next guy that flies the airplane because now they're all dried on there, they're harder to get off. So when we fly the airplanes, clean up ask after yourself. Right, Russ? These are your airplanes. Wings, tail, and prop. Now the upper Leading as is, it's just almost impossible to ask people to clean that off. So every now and then we get out the ladder, we get up and sometimes have to use one of those little plastic scrubbers to get the bugs off. But at least get the lower leading edges, the struts, the tail section, and uh, get the bugs off there and, and also the, the uh, leading edge of the prop. Check your hops time and complete the log. Anybody have any question on on uh, how the uh, hop system works in the airplane? This one is airspeed, so it doesn't start recording till you're 40 knots. Quits recording on landing after you uh, decelerate through 40 knots. You get the hops meter, it's on the uh, little electrical panel forward of the uh, aft control, control stick. So get the hops time to complete the logbook with your number of landings in the manner that uh, John pointed out earlier. Anybody have any questions? Reference materials. We have all kinds of stuff for you to look at. And again, I'll uh, get a list going if anybody wants uh, revision number eight of our uh, Stearman training program. Uh, PT-17 Air Force Manual, we have a copy of that available to you, the NQS-4. Dash 4, dash four, by the way, is the Continental Engine. Uh, we have the uh, Primary Flying Instructor Manual and the SRA website. We also have SRA magazines you can look through that are very educational because it tells you what all these people are doing with Stearman experience to resolve mechanical problems with the airplane. Be sure to review the Sturman Training Guide Revision 8. Fly safe. Questions? One uh, thing I think is worth mentioning when moving this airplane in and out of a hangar, uh, the upper wing has a wider span than the lower. So if you're right close to the lower wing, you have to look straight up to see your clearance overhead. Or stand back far enough you can see them both. It's that's a trap waiting to get you. Chris? Pete, anything else? Russ? No. Nope. Francois? God, I was sure counting on a debate from you. <laughs> later. 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 Mention uh, the hand on the really? wing tips. Not to use them. Is it, in any in the case you want my hat back on or? No, no, no. Absolutely. <laughs> I thought maybe the glare. Yes, but what's that? You might mention the the hand grips on the the lower wing, not to use them. That's a good point. I the, the hand grips were built obviously to help ground handle the airplanes. I don't like us using them because there's these little brass nails in there, and jerking around on that tends to loosen those up. So I always use the uh, it, the bottom of the end struts, either in the front or the back, to you know to move the airplane. We have a, uh, a electric tug and a tailwheel tow bar for the airplane. The tug you want to make sure that it's plugged in with the switch off when not in use. It's really important to make sure the switch is off 
if you just are using it and you've stopped using it for a minute to do something, turn the switch off. This thing has been creeping on us and it'll run into something and damage it because it's very insidious, but it, uh, it does do that. The tailwheel tow bar. Make sure if you're using a tailwheel tow bar that you use it and then take the airplane off so the weight of the airplane is not sitting on that tow bar because it put, we have a hard rubber tire. Dents in the tailwheel causes shimmy, causes thumping, and we can't keep turning the tailwheel because we're going to run out of tailwheel if we keep doing that. So please remember, it, or if somebody else, if you're just around and you see that somebody has, has inadvertently left the tail on the tow bar and it's up off the ground so the weight is pushing down on 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 the uh, tow wheel uh, or tail wheel uh, apparatus so it, it will dent that you want to make sure that either you tell the guy or, or go take it off yourself so it, it doesn't sit sit there uh, with the weight on the uh, tail so you wheel tow bar. Cleaning the struts. Another good point, when you do the wipe down, I forgot to mention it, but make sure that you wipe especially the top of the landing gear struts because it'll build up a little grime and as the struts work, that grime will get up there and there's windings and, and uh, O-rings up there and that's where you'll develop leaks and if we have a bad enough leak, we already have a very slight leak in the right gear strut and if it develops enough we're going to have to actually take the gear apart. Big job, expensive. <clears throat> so we can do a lot to prevent that type of expense just by in our post flight wiping that down. Also another thing is a courtesy of the next guy, the uh, we have a little bit of an oil seep out the front seal that's thrown back, the front windshield gets it. So if you just think about it, just wipe off the, the front window when you when you get done and it's ready and the passengers will have a nice view and won't have a mess to look out. Anything else I didn't cover? No, uh, I just kind of, kind of, kind of throw in one thing. Um, Russ, you can be over here, but the, the whole idea behind the 100 hour wheel landing, three point landing restriction is we want to kind of, you know, from talking to guys from Midland and guys who've been instructed on the airplane, they seem to have better success with three-point landings in this airplane and not taking weight things. So that's what we're striving for. If you haven't flown the airplane in a while, you're out there, it's a squirrely situation, the airplane you normally fly, you, you normally wheel land, and that's what you're comfortable doing. You're wheel land the airplane so you don't break it, and then come find me for a little three-point landing practice or schedule yourself on a nice calm day go out there and put six or seven batteries on the airplane and get yourself comfortable again doing three points. That's, does that make sense to everybody? Smart. So we're not, we don't want to force you into, I'm not really comfortable doing this, but they said I had to, to where you're putting yourself in the airplane at risk. If you're more comfortable, land it so you don't break it and you don't break yourself and then get yourself to the point where we're going back into the way we want to operate here. Is that all good? Correct. Do you think that that happens because they don't, we don't fly the tail down in the chairman when you wheel it on it? If you fly it down, you're much safer than if you kind of should always fly the tail down. Fly it down. Yeah, don't let the run out of steam and drop down because the upper wing on this airplane tends to block out the rudder in that transitional effect. And if you were positively uh, lowering it with your elevator, you have better control, even though you won't have any directional control available to you for a, a short period during that transition, tail up to, to tail down, either on takeoff or landing. So. Anybody else? Well, let me know when you're ready to go flying. I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.